You guys uh, were supposed to get Javier Bastardo right now. I am sorry to disappoint you. I am simply Walker. Um, I am the slightly lesser half of the crypto couple. Uh, but I do have the distinct pleasure of introducing a man who has been quite a prolific contributor to both free and open source software and to Bitcoin specifically. So the next talk is titled A Short History of Double Spend Protection. And I'd like you all to give a warm welcome to Peter Todd. A little warmer, come on. Thank you. Yeah, so this is a nice short talk, a little rapid fire uh, intro to all the wonderful and weird ways that we've done double spend prevention. And you know, if you're going to go start with all the ways, I mean, you really got to start from the beginning. Cameron, oh, there we go. There you go, the Big Bang, when physics was created. Because if you're talking about double spend prevention, you kind of got to like ask, well, you know, well, well, why, why do we need this in the first place? And it really comes down to, you know, things in economics are constrained. And why are they constrained? Well, ultimately because of physics. And physics is tons of conservation laws and whatnot that, you know, mean that the economy is a limited thing. And all of the stuff I'm going to talk about, it's really ways of allocating resources in the economy. You know, it's your standard economic thinking, like how do you go and represent one thing or another thing. So, how do we do this initially? Well, there's this idea that we did all with barter, which when it works right, of course, is the use of physics itself. I mean, you know, I go trade you one thing for another thing and so on. But, you know, in human history, the fact is barter was actually really rare. Like, it's just far too inconvenient to have systems where, you know, I'm trying to go trade you a cute squirrel or whatever animal that is for, you know, a CD or an accordion or something. It never really works out. You know, the real way that we did so-called double spend prevention, really allocation of resources, was the gift economy early on. And what the gift economy really is, is just saying, hey, you know, my little tribe of people, we have a rough idea of who has contributed what. So to the extent double spend prevention exists, it's more as in, you know, I think you brought home more meat yesterday and I really liked your arrowheads and we'll kind of even this out. You know, it's a very, very fuzzy concept, but in small, small scales it works. For bigger scales, you get to, of course, gold and coinage. And what I find interesting about this picture is this is actually one of your first examples of security flaw, where, well, back when gold coins were gold coins, Gold, of course, was a thing we kind of settled on rather than barter. But notice how this gold coin isn't around? That's because people start chipping off the edges. Because if you have a gold coin that people think is representing something by fiat, you slice off the edge, you can go melt it down, and you get a bit of gold, and you've like, literally debased the currency by, by slicing it up. It's, a, it's an interesting security flaw. And of course, going on a little further, yeah, I'm on clicker. There we go. You get demand notes. And again, in this case, it's representing gold, you know, and gold coin payable to bear on demand, yada, yada, yada. But from a security point of view, well, you know, what's the, what's the mechanism here? Well, the mechanism is really one of auditing and a combination of trust. Well, what do I mean by auditing? Well, notice how... Here, I'll leave this thing in. No, laser would be much easier. <laughs> well, anyway, so apparently this thing doesn't have a laser, which would be easier. But so you notice how you have uh, serial numbers on these? Part of the auditing process for bills was to go and have some mechanism of tr keeping track of, you know, how many were out there. It's a very loose mechanism given it's an enormous amount of work to start looking at this stuff, but that's like part of these mechanisms being built in. You know, the bills themselves are difficult to go replicate. There's only a few people who can go do it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think you get the idea there. And of course, banking, it's the same idea, but in different forms. You know, and you get electronic banking where you go and have some ability to go audit and so on. But, you know, ultimately, like I think to computer science people, maybe Donald Knuth being an exception. All this kind of isn't that interesting because it's, it's just so fuzzy. You know, what was the thing that kind of really started becoming more interesting? Well, first we kind of had to go solve some privacy issues and that gets us Xiaomi and tokens. And 
I won't go into the math for like how Xiaomi and tokens work in detail, but you can think of them this way, which is I have a bank and I want the ability to go and redeem something from them in the future. And I wrap a nonce, you know, a number that I've picked, and have them sign it in such a way that I can go and present it to other people without you know, where it came from being, uh, being obvious. And then that lets me kind of give you this money that then you re-redeem and then the bank doesn't know who exactly did it transfer through. But again, we have a bank. And it, the auditing problem of this is even worse. But certainly Xiaomi and Tokens had this interesting property where suddenly a whole bunch of cryptographers got excited. They thought, hang on a second, you know, we can go make this stuff private. We're no longer having to rely on like dollar bills for privacy that for that matter have serial numbers on them and can be put in databases. So finally, we get something that kind of works, which is blockchain. And as you can see, um, here, as you see, a uh, blockchain is, um, I guess, a sphere or a network or like something or another. I mean, it's all very confusing what exactly it is. But you know, I like to go keep it simple, which is blockchain is a chain of blocks. Now, why is a chain of blocks interesting? Well, because you and I can agree on what should be at the tip of this. And if we can agree on that, since we can go backwards following the blocks and verifying the hashes, we can be sure that we're looking at the same data. So what can we do with that? Well, we can go say that part of that data represents transactions. You know, we can go have a piece of data that using digital signatures that can be signed by people and say, hey, this money should move from this place to this place. And if you can do that, you can go and start coming to a shared consensus over you know, who owns what by just starting at the beginning of this chain and then working your way towards the end. Now, the tricky part is, well, how do you decide like, which is the chain and that gets into proof of work and so on. But I think for the sake of this talk, we'll say, look, there, there are ways to go decide on this. Some of them are really dumb, like Blockstream Liquid, which just has a bunch of essentially banks going and signing statements. Some of them are more clever, like proof of work. Some of them, some people argue, are clever, like proof of stake. But the important thing is we can come to that consensus. Now, what's more interesting than blockchain? Well, if you've heard of Ripple, what I'm about to describe is probably not what you think it is. Because Ripple, the coin, as we've heard it, is basically a centralized blockchain scam. But Ripple, the idea, was very interesting, which was, you know, why don't we have links between people who trust each other and route through those links? Now, this dates back to something called Hawala, which was a very old um, practice in a lot of uh, Middle Eastern countries, as well as, you know, the more generally the world, where you'd have money transfer through personal connections. And the way this winds up working is, you know, if I trust, you know, Alice, and Alice trusts Bob, and Bob trusts Charlie, I don't have to trust all those other links to go send money through them. You know, we can go and just keep a record of, well, how much do we owe each other and just rec keep track of that as we go along and as payments are routed through. And with Ripple, the idea was, well, why don't we add computers to this and create these links, write the software, keep it in computer databases, automate it all so that you can send money through this. And as long as the, you have a path of counterparties who trust each other, this does work. Of course, the problem is, as long as you have a path of counterparties who trust each other, you know, getting that to work is kind of hard in the real world. It's not something you can easily do in, say, a decentralized network. But it's a very interesting option, and it's kind of a pity that Ripple destroyed the name of this very interesting technology. And frankly, like, out of you know, all the things I've kind of mentioned so far, this is one of the few alternatives to blockchain with this kind of level of technology that's plausible to even work. So, can we improve on this? Well, we can have an idea of called payment channel. And the idea with a payment channel is you say, well, all right, we have a system like Bitcoin, we have a blockchain, we have some way of creating transactions. Those transactions are, if they're on a blockchain, they're broadcast to everyone, and that's kind of annoying if you only want to send a little bit of money, but 
How about instead we create a system where, let's suppose we want to send a lot of money over and over again to someone else. Well, if I want to go send money to Alice, I and Alice can get together and sign a two of two locked ad, you know, chunk of money where we can both spend it. And then to represent spending more of that, we can continue to sign new transactions, changing how much money goes from that pot of gold, if you will, to Alice and myself. And each one of these transactions kind of splits it in a different way. And what's interesting from a double spend point of view is this is all about incentives. You know, if I'm sending more and more money to Alice, the reason why it works as double spend is because she has the possibility of collecting that amount of money in the future. But she doesn't have to. But that's her incentives. Of course, how do I turn this into something more like Ripple? I mean, this is just, you know, one link from one person to another. You know, we want it to look kind of like this, with sender and receiver and a whole bunch of people in between. Well, Lightning Channels improve on this by saying, why don't we add punishment to it? And I do not have time to get into the full details of how all this works. But I think that conceptually what you should take away from this is Lightning Channels are saying, hey, if I give Alice the possibility of getting some money, and I give Alice possible of getting even more money, we can send money in the other direction by putting Alice in a position where if she broadcasts the wrong amount, I can punish her and take the money back. And that is what this complex state diagram that doesn't even begin to show all the different steps represents. You know, I have given Alice the ability to take money, then Alice gives me the ability to take all her money if she publishes the wrong amount to settle the transaction. Now the second thing that Lightning does is it makes this atomic across multiple different parties. And the way it does that is, you know, it's kind of clever in how they reveal the right secrets and so on. Again, I really don't have time to go talk about all this 20 minute talk, but I hope you kind of come away with an appreciation of what's going on. All right, so now I want to go and shift gears a little bit because I think we basically covered all the main categories that people do with double spins to prevent th you know, bad things from happening in monetary systems. But that's actually not the only category we have. You know, another category we have is a more generalized idea of a double spend, which is sort of about uniqueness and about committing to the right course of action. And, well, what am I showing here? I'm showing here something that is every bit as secure as lightning, even though it existed in the medieval ages, which is a split tally stick. So let's suppose you and I have this problem where we want to record a deal of some kind, some, you know, some piece of data saying, hey, you know, we agreed on this amount. How can we prove to a third party, or at least some degree of proof, that that recording was correct and someone hadn't changed one side of the deal. Well, we can quite literally get a piece of wood, split it down the middle, after putting notches representing our deal. And what's crazy about this is, you know, creating two pieces of wood that match together is something that is basically, you know, infeasible, even with our technology. You know, you try to go get two organic pieces of wood, they'll stand up scrutiny that, you know, are, are arranged differently. It's not really feasible. So this kind of does a double spin prevention in the sense that now the other party can't fake a record. Unfortunately, it's a little inconvenient because you wind up with whole pinch pieces of wood. And uh, a real tragedy of uh, split tally sticks is there was a gigantic record of them in the UK archives that actually burnt down because uh, someone had a fireplace that uh, set, you know, set all the sticks on fire. But we have something kind of similar too, which is a single use seal. Well, what's this thing? I mean, it's a piece of plastic that's numbered uniquely, and you can go put it around something. And the manufacturer promises they'll never make two ones with the same number. Of course, this is a real physical object. You can do things like put on shipping containers, and that means that what's inside the shipping container can't be replaced without breaking that seal. And there's also another kind of double spend prevention, if you will, of the tradition of public notice. 
where you say, hey, I want to go do something, and I don't want to be able to equivocate. I don't want to be able to have two different courses of history or two different ideas of what I'm doing out there. Well, what do I do? Well, I put notice in some public place, like a newspaper, saying, hey, you know, I am announcing something or another. I'm announcing that, you know, I now own this property, that I'm going to make a sale, whatever it is other people need to know about, and I put in that public place. And the interesting thing about this is this kind of smells like a blockchain, doesn't it? You know, this works because we can all kind of agree on what the public notice place is. We all have access to the same newspapers in much the same way we all have the same access to a blockchain. And I'll point out with the single use seal thing, I mean, you can make these given a blockchain by saying, well, the definition of a seal is publishing data in the right way in the right place. And now you have something that's a generic primitive for creating consensus over data. You know, we, you and I can agree on a course of action where neither of us can, quote unquote, double spend it by trying to publish different pieces of data. And of course, you know, unsurprisingly, you can make these out of Bitcoin transactions too. And there are efforts going working on this. Not to mention, I mean, one of the most, um, there we go. One of the most common things is something called certificate transparency, which is how you know that when you go to your bank's website or you know, your doctor's website or whatever, you're actually talking to the right computer because the certificates that sign all the stuff, they get put in a public notice blockchain-like thing called certificate, certificate transparency lock. And in terms of cryptographic double spend prevention, this kind of not that well-known thing, certificate transparency logs, are probably actually the most common use case in the world, because pretty much every time you go to a website, proof from certificate transparency log is downloaded to your web browser and verified. And with that, thank you and maybe some questions? We have time here for a couple of questions. Does anybody have some? We've got one in the back there. Oh, oh, we've got one right here in the front, too. Hi, Peter. So on the, on the topic of uh, double spend prevention, I'm curious, do you have, I don't know, do you have any opinions about uh, double spend prevention for zero conf Bitcoin transactions, perhaps? <laughs> I may or may not have planted that question. Well, so the neat thing about that is this is kind of a weird consensus over a network. You know, what does it mean? Well, if I broadcast a Bitcoin transaction and it kind of floats around all your mempools and stuff, the default behavior of them is to just let it sit there until another transaction, you know, comes by that either, you know, it's, it's like, how do I put it? So, it, you know, they kind of go sit there until like either it gets mined in a block or Potentially, if there's a certain bit set, a transaction comes with a higher fee. And if that bit isn't set, it's sort of a pinky swear, hey, we won't go and let a double spend happen. And what's neat about that is, quote unquote neat, is if I can go and attack all of your uh, computers on the network, or you know, just be a miner who goes and says something else, you know, decides to go include that double spend, all this just falls apart. And uh, well, why wouldn't I mention it? Because of it, all these things that I mentioned, Historically, it's been one of the weakest forms of double spend prevention. What else? We have time for one more. Back right. Hey, uh, I appreciate your ability to like separate the innovation of Ripple from like the Shitcoin. Uh, is there any other like modern innovations that you've seen in the space that's kind of like outside of the Overton window of Bitcoin talk that you appreciate and admire? So, so say again, like um, in like, innovations yeah. I admire? Yeah, like anything else in like like quote unquote like Shitcoin land that like Bitcoiners typically don't talk about, but you used to like admire the innovation, like maybe not how they're doing it, but like what they're doing. You know, like at, le at least like limiting the answer that something somewhat related to my talk. I, what I really found interesting, go, you know, preparing for this talk was thinking through how limited the technology is, and I don't want to say that like you know other projects aren't doing interesting things, but rather the categories that they do 
pretty much everything falls into one of the categories I mentioned in my talk. And, you know, it's kind of amazing how, you know, all of humanity, we've come up with so few ways of creating uniqueness, if you will. Now, certainly the details of how we do this, you know, I mean, frankly, like lightning is a miracle of modern innovation in terms of how complex it is. And I'll also go give a lot of credit to things like uh, Join Market, Wasabi, and so on for taking Xiaomian tokens and using them for CoinJoin. But certainly, it's remarkable how these categories of things still fall into other forms of double spend prevention. And we've had a very, very hard time coming up with something truly novel that actually works. You know, unless you want to get into craziness like, you know, quantum uncloning theorem and potential of maybe making quantum e-cash. But no one's actually shown that, right, outside of a lab. So for production stuff, you know, I, I think a lot of it's really making existing ideas work better and improving on the details. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please give Peter another round of applause.